I would say always hire somebody better and smarter than you in the roles that you don't need to be in. And then take your key talents and use those so that that's what you focus on every day. And then as a team, your company should grow. That will save you years of agony and time. Welcome to The In Factor, conversations about how great entrepreneurs started, stumbled, and succeeded. I'm Rebecca White, and our next guest is Amber Kelleher Andrews, an internationally renowned relationship expert, professional matchmaker, TV personality, film producer, and philanthropy enthusiast. She is the CEO of global matchmaking firm Kelleher International. Founded in 1984, Kelleher International continues to set the gold standard today for upscale personalized matchmaking in a billion dollar industry. In today's interview, Amber talks about what it was like to start a business with her mother more than 30 years ago and gives us a sneak peek into what it's like to be a successful entrepreneur in the love business. Please enjoy this interview with Amber Kelleher Andrews. Amber, thank you for joining us today on In Factor. I'm really excited to have the chance to talk with you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Good. Well, tell us a little bit about your business and, you know, what led you and your mom into the love industry? (laughs) Well, I love calling it the love industry. I'm glad that you said that because what better industry to be in than love? And my mother, who is still the founder and works every day with me, she's my boss. She started this company and came up with the concept of matchmaking before it was commercially known. And this goes back to the 80s. So we've been a matchmaking firm for 33 years. And when she started the idea of matchmaking, you have to remember, we take so many things for granted, but there were no computers sitting on desks. Cell phones were quite a ways away in terms of, you know, actually holding a phone that you could physically use, let alone that be a computer and a a dating service on your phone. So when she came up with the idea, it was really in the future. And she knew that there would be a need for people, most importantly, with a high net earners that have a lot of discretion, that want to be kept confidential, that have, I would say, the need to be discreet in terms of their net worth. And so from celebrities to entrepreneurs, there are people that aren't comfortable with going online now. So her idea 33 years ago really is in play today as Mm -hmm. we speak because not everybody wants to be on Bumble and on Tinder, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's a fabulous business to be in and it's definitely a niche industry. So your mom started Kelleher International and were there any other matchmaking businesses out there at that time? No, the closest thing that there was was a company called Great Expectations. And I remember Saturday Night Live used to make a joke and say, lower expectations or (laughs) some (laughs) some funny skit about it. And what they did, they were really smart. They would send mailers out and you would open up your mail and it would say great expectations and, you know, come down to our office and look through videos of singles in your community and choose who you want to meet. So this is really the beginning of the dating services. And my mother, Jill Kelleher, was asked to be a photographer at Great Expectations. So now you can kind of see where this all Mm -hmm. started. Mm -hmm. So she was a photographer. She grew up in the film industry, had a great eye behind the camera and beautiful in front of the camera, but very, very good behind the camera and was known for taking photographs of actors and models in the San Francisco Bay Area for many years. And when Great Expectations opened up in Sausalito, they needed a photographer to take pictures of all of the single people that they envisioned having photographs in the books of their library. So there's my mother, Jill, taking pictures of people as they're joining, kind of like a membership to a gym. They join the club, they go in, and instead of working out on the machines, they'd go in and open up books and look at people and then circle the number of the individual that they wanted to meet, bring it up to the front desk and say, you know, I'm member number number 205, and I'm interested in meeting number 206. Hmm, And my mother was the one responsible for all those photographs. So in her taking pictures, she discovered that there was a better way 
to match people, like to actually be the go-between because she would take a photograph of a woman and then a couple weeks later take a photograph of a man and she'd know that they were a match because she spent the afternoon with them. But she wasn't confident that they would pick each other out in the photo book. So she started matching people. And then she realized, well, wait a minute, not everybody at the time, there wasn't Google, but you know, at least known. So where does the owner of IBM, where does the owner of Sears, where do the big people go to find a match? Because they're not going to walk through great expectations and go to the library with kind of the riffraff right. of, the, of the single scene. <laughs> right. So she came to me when I was about 12 years old and she said, I have an idea. And I think I want to match people that can't come into these dating services. And that was the creation of Kelleher back in the 80s. That's great. So you were 12 years old when she started this. And when did you join her? You know, you mentioned that this is your dream job. Is this what you wanted to do? Work with her from age 12 on? I started at 14. <laughs> and um, Let's don't tell anybody and, in the child labor law area, right? <laughs> I know, I know. What I did is I would look through all of the people that she would send her mailers to. Because again, uh -huh. there was only one way to really reach people. And so she had me overlook all of the, what we call leads today. And I would choose the people that I thought she should speak to. And so she had me involved in the idea of almost like a search firm. I was a recruiter, hmm. I guess you could say, and uh -huh. I would find the people. And by the time I was 16, was able to legally work, I would start setting those appointments. I was on the phone setting the appointments with the individuals to come in and to meet with my mother. And then five years after that, when I was 21, I went down to LA because I was following in my mother's previous footsteps of the film and entertainment world. I didn't know that I wanted to do matchmaking because it hadn't really formed yet. She was doing dinner parties and she was meeting with people and she was matching them, but it wasn't, it hadn't quite formed mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I went to Los Angeles and I was in the film business that I would get calls from my mother weekly and watched how this grew. She would call me and say, I signed up my first client. And the next thing you know, she'd say, I matched my first client and they're, they're already in love. And I did it on two matches. And then she'd say, I signed up my next client. So she would bring me through the process. I've learned everything from my mom, everything from how to start a business to how to run a business to how to buy a house. <laughs> I mean, this is for entrepreneurs. I'm lucky because my mother was a natural entrepreneur before that word was really used much. Mm -hmm. And while matchmaking dates back to 5,000 years, and you can say it's always been around, we've coined many of the phrases here in America, like feedback forms and, and special search and, you know, national memberships and, you know, local searches and all of the things that just seem like normal conversations. Those were words that my mom and I coined all those years ago. And people would say, well, what is a feedback form? Now you can call any matchmaker and they'll say, well, we, you know, we work with feedback forms. <laughs> and wow. It's just like, you know, normal normal stuff. So it is a dream job in that we're always creating, we're that always is, improving. That, I love that story. You know, my mom was also an entrepreneur and very influential in my life. And I just wrote a blog post recently about what I learned from her about the entrepreneurial spirit. And it's exciting because you and your mom were pioneers in the space that has really exploded over this 30 plus year period that you've been involved your company, you and your team, your mom and you and the rest of your team have worked in this industry with, as you pointed out, a lot of people that might want to stay rather under the radar when they are going through this kind of experience. A lot of Hollywood celebrities and Fortune 500 executives, professional athletes. But it sounds like at least initially it was very labor intensive. How have you scaled this kind of business? Well, I think it was the beautiful synergy of the entertainment business, which was her background and was my focus as a young adult, and then this new concept of personalized matchmaking that she had come up with. So while I was in Los Angeles in my young 20s, I was working with producers. I was working with celebrities. I was on both sides of the camera. I worked for Roland Joffe of The Killing Fields for the late Tony Scott from Top Gun and all the great movies that Tony Scott did. And I was very close with Roman Coppola and, and would hang out with him at his father's house, which was, of course, Francis Ford Coppola. So we had this kind of circle of entertainment and of the brains of kind of that, you know, world in Tinseltown. 
And so when my mom got things going in the San Francisco Bay Area, it dawned on her that it would be so easy if her daughter, Amber, who was now an adult, could run the so-called L.A. office. So she asked me to get involved. And it was really just, honestly, Rebecca, to answer the phones and to set appointments, which, of course, I had already done when I was 14 years old back when Mm -hmm. she first started. So it was it was more like, hey, Amber, while you're in the film and entertainment business, instead of working at a restaurant, haha, because most people <laughs> have to have a real job when you're right. in the entertainment business, right. why don't you work for your mom? You know, answer the phone, set appointments, and she was going to fly down to LA and to meet with the individual and then match them and bring them under her wing. But what we didn't know is that the moment that I spoke to the person on the phone, I took interest in who they were. So I said, mom, don't fly down. That's silly. I'll go meet them. And then I would meet them and I'd be fascinated by their life and unbelievable that they could be single. And how is this even possible? They're, they're amazing. So my next thing was, well, mom, don't worry. I'll match them. I've got ideas. I want to work with this person. So it became more of a dual office. So then there was Jill's office in San Francisco and Amber's office in LA. And it worked out great, except for the fact that I was no longer in the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. So in comes a potential client for me. I sit down with her and she says, you know, you should be on TV. And I said, well, funny enough, I I was before I started doing this. And she says, well, why don't you do this on TV? And I said, how would that work? What, how would a matchmaker be on TV? And she said, I have a feeling everybody's going to want to hear this story. Within about 10 days, I was on entertainment tonight. And then I was on E and extra and they were fascinated that there was such a thing. And now you have the computers. And of course, Match.com was just barely starting. It was actually called Mm Matchmaker.com. And it had this little wand. And it was kind of this weird thing that you'd put your information in the computer. And so it was kind of creepy and still is for some people. But but it was at least starting to be talked about. So I'm now on shows. And these shows are national shows. So you can imagine how quickly the mother-daughter L.A. San Francisco office would turn into calls from New York, Chicago, you know, Washington, D.C., Miami, and everywhere else. Like, well, why aren't you doing this here? I need your services too. So I became the CEO and I said to my mom, I think this is what I want to do. I'm going to go around the country and open up offices. And that's how that started. Wow. So where, how many offices do you have? Well, so, you know, times have changed with real estate and now that we're virtual, but so we, we had a lot of offices that are just absolutely unnecessary after about 10 years. So we currently have offices, our headquarters is in the San Francisco Bay area. And then we also have, we kept our office in Texas because it's just such a big area for us. I mean, Texas is big, right? And so when we pulled our offices out of Los Angeles and New York and Arizona and various places. We kept Texas and we kept the San Francisco Bay area where the majority is. And then we're also, we're just actually opening up a new office down in the Montecito area of California where I live. And I'm actually signing a lease tomorrow and we're, we're expanding kind of our LA slash Santa Barbara headquarters is going to be in Montecito starting next week. So, but you have clients all over the world, Kelleher. Clients are all over the world. It's a global company. That's very exciting. So, you know, you've been talking about, you know, you've been explaining some about how your business works and it sounds different and, you know, it's not necessarily built on a mathematical algorithm. There's a lot of, it's very high touch, very personal. Can you tell us a little bit about the approach and how it works and where it came from? Absolutely. And it's a really good point. We're not manufacturing anything. So we're not putting it on an assembly line and we can't count how fast that assembly line can go and therefore how many, you know, how many employees do we need and how many hours a week are we open? Those are very easy, you know, mathematical equations and for scaling it's, it's necessary. So your question is really important and it's something that I love math. I love creating. And this is kind of where I revel in in all of these decisions. It is still very, it's simple and complicated at the same time. We meet people and we match them. It's not rocket science. It's very simple. However, the way in which we match is important and the people that we match really speaks to our brand. So while there are a lot of matchmaking companies in the world and there should continue to be and they should always improve and get better, the hardest thing for people to crack is the caliber of the individuals that they represent because there's just not a lot of trust anymore 
and there's not a lot of experience because people, they think that they can make money in this industry and they think, oh my goodness, there's matchmakers that are charging $10,000, $100,000. How is this possible? I want to do this. And when they see that somebody from my company will, will take a check from some individual with a massive amount of money and come back into the company, that person that's holding that check thinks for a second, well, if I did this for myself, I could have this money. And trust me, they've tried. The mm -hmm. problem is that they're responsible for that individual for the next year or two. And that individual has very high expectations if they paid that money. So how is it that you're going to go out and find matches for that person over and over and over again for two years and then be responsible for the next person and the next person and the next person? And then suddenly you're not sleeping at night and the next thing you know, you've gotten yourself into trouble. And I've seen this happen with so many people. Where, where people trust us because we've been around for so long, we've built up a reputation and we've built up a network and we are a community. And for somebody to come into this community, they are now just enhancing the community that already exists. So to go back to how do we do it, it's taken years and years and decades to build the most valuable community in the world of single people. And it is not something that you can do overnight. But if you want to be a matchmaker for a small group of people, you really have to figure out how to the skills of listening. You need to take on someone that you believe you can match, that you feel you can find an individual for that person and listen to what it is that they're asking for. Because sometimes your idea of a match for them isn't necessarily what they're asking for. And you have to be careful. People ask for things that maybe aren't the best for them, but they want to trust that you understand that they're still in charge of their own life. So it's a delicate balance. And the way that we do it is we hire coaches that have background in, in they have PhDs, they have masters, they're life coaches. We also have, a, like I said, the huge network in which to work with. We've pumped a lot of time and energy into our software so that our community of over 93,000 people can be pulled up rather quickly based on algorithms. So we're going to use the algorithms to pull people that are a certain age range in a certain demographic in a certain location. And at that point, we have skilled individuals that are somewhat recruiting and looking at values, looking at morals, looking at education, looking at where they want to be in their life so that we're not just doing what you would call a spaghetti match. So it's a very simple concept, but it's very complicated behind the scenes. And that's why people trust us because we've been doing it for so long. We're, we really know what we're doing. You know, this is fascinating. It brings a lot of thought to mind for me. First of all, this is, like you said, it's taken years to build this network, which is incredibly valuable for your business and what you do. A network like that is also how entrepreneurs in general get things done. Having a, you know, a trusted group of people that you can connect with and work with. But it's fascinating the way that this has evolved over the years. As you pointed out, it's not something that happens very quickly. And, you know, I can speak probably for a lot of people. I've had a few forays into trying to match people <laughs> and it hasn't worked out. So I know it's the ideas sound simple, but there's a lot of complexity in understanding what works and what doesn't. And uh, I'm just fascinated by this. You know, as we're talking about that, I'm sure all of our listeners would love some tips on relationships from a relationship expert. I don't know if you're willing to go down that path, but since you've been <laughs> doing this for such a long time, how do you know what relationships will last and which ones won't? Well, I think that when you see people, when you see like people that are together as a couple, right? You're asking like, how do you know that that relationship is going to last? Is that, is that what your question is? Yeah. Well, you know, for example, I think a lot of us have probably tried to match up people we knew thinking that it sounded good and then it bombed. And, you know, you're in the business of matching people, but that match needs to last a while. Otherwise, people are pretty dissatisfied <laughs> down the road. So, Absolutely. I see this as kind of a two-prong effect. One is that if you're good at this, you have intuition. And the intuition is really important because I can absolutely know that somebody is a match for someone. And I haven't even looked at their profile. And I don't even know if they have anything in common, but I know that they're a match. Now that's intuition. And I can say, I know I just met your husband or I know I just met your wife. And you know they'll come back to me and say, how did you know that? And it's just a feeling. So that exists. 
And we don't want to underplay that because I think that that's also why my mother and I have been able to be more successful in this industry because we are very intuitive and we don't ignore that. And we try to lead with it as much as we can because it's a talent in itself. Wherever it comes from, I don't know, but it exists and it's real. The way in which we structure our company, because you can't go and hire people based on some you know, crazy, elusive talent that you can't, that's not tangible. What we do is this brings in that feedback form. It's if you think of a puzzle, if you just throw all the pieces of, let's say there's even 20 pieces, we'll do a simple puzzle, 20 pieces, you can kind of get an idea of what it might be. Maybe it's of the ocean, maybe it's of a city, buildings, but you don't really know what you're looking at yet until you start putting the pieces together. And so the way in which matchmaking works at Kelleher at least, and I think just in general for people, but because again, we have a system and a rhythm and it's you know tried and true. Each time we speak with the client, whether it's talking about somebody that they met on their own, talking about a past relationship, or more importantly, talking about the match that we just introduced them to, depending upon how much they're willing to share of their opinion of that person and of their first opinion of them and how it was left and where it's going to go. These are all pieces to that puzzle. Mm -hmm. So every time we're getting information, we're turning over a piece and we're fitting it into the actual puzzle itself. Now, sometimes it takes one match and we learn so much that we can see exactly what we want. Other times we're getting little tiny pieces from somebody and it's more of one of those thousand piece puzzles where you're like, oh my God, I've been working on this for days and I have no idea what I'm even looking at. But eventually, depending upon how open the person is and how well we are, you know, getting that information from them, we will step back after three or four introductions and say, I know exactly what I'm looking for. And at that point, it's our job to go and identify that individual. It could be based on values. It could be based on morals. It could be based on, again, the education, how old they are, the kids and a personality and that they, we know their physical type. These are all keys, right? But there's many more things behind that. Some people don't want Exactly. You think, oh, two people are in the medical field. That's perfect. But guess what? They come home. They don't want to talk about medicine. They want to talk about something entirely different. Mm -hmm. So there's many different, many different pieces to this puzzle. And it's different for every single individual that comes in. And that's how it works. Eventually, you know what you're looking for. Sometimes it's quick. Sometimes it takes time. But when you see that person and they fit that last piece to the puzzle, that's the match. That makes so much sense. You've become relationship coaches as well as matchmakers. And it makes, I'm sure a lot of people come out of working with you much better partners than they might have been otherwise. So it's fascinating. Yeah, it's a a journey within for sure. Yeah. So Amber, we are talking right now about six or seven weeks into the U.S. response to the COVID-19 pandemic. There's been a lot of challenges from personal challenges of not being able to be sometimes with our loved ones to lots of business challenges. A lot of people are struggling right now. A lot of companies are, there are business opportunities, but there are also companies that are having to, to really rethink their business. What kind of changes have you had to make in your business in response to this? And you know, on a secondary level, what do you expect for relationships in the next months and perhaps years as we have to deal with our fears and and all the other challenges associated with this pandemic? Mm, Yes. Two big questions, um, I know. Two huge questions. (laughs) So we'll start with the COVID-19 because when listeners hear this years down the line, they're going to be like, oh yeah, that's that weird virus that happened for six or seven (laughs) months that changed the world. Aside from all of the horrible, you know, health concerns and the people that have passed and all of the obvious sadness that comes with anybody that has been affected by this, we're going to turn off that station and focus on entrepreneurialism for the sake of this podcast. This is the most incredible opportunity for any business owner because it is a chance to refresh and renew and start over. And if anybody that listens to this has a company that hasn't taken advantage of this amazing opportunity, then they are missing a chance of a lifetime. This is the time to step back and rethink everything. Because if you have a car at the top of a hill and that car starts momentum, 
by the time you're halfway down the hill, it's very hard to stop that car. And that's what a business is. Once a business gets going and it's good and it has nothing in its way, it becomes a very fast moving machine. And how often can you stop and turn that car? You can't turn that car. It's going to flip. But we now have had this amazing buffer to come in and somehow slow that car down. And for some people, it's still running. But even if it's running, the chances now you can turn that car and you can make a change. And that's what we're doing at Kelleher. We're the top matchmaking firm in the world, but we're seeing this, as you mentioned, trailblazers. We are, it's our obligation and our responsibility to change the way we do business because people follow us as examples. They come to us, they're trained against us. The competitors call us to figure out how we're doing business. And I talk to people that have worked for other matchmaking firms that are looking for jobs and they'll, you know, maybe answer an ad for us and they'll say, you know, I was trained on your company, even though I was working for another company. And so what we're doing now specifically just to get through the COVID, because we are a face-to-face in-person matchmaking firm. So imagine our horror when we woke up and went, oh my God, people can't meet. (laughs) Right. <laughs> what do we right. do? But I never, I never had any fear. I was just like, okay, we just changed the way we do business. So, you know, just like a Zoom call, we are matching people virtually, but you have to understand these are really interesting people. So they're so creative. And some feedback that I've gotten is a gentleman will send a bottle of really beautiful wine or champagne to his date that we've matched him with. And They meet that evening and they open up the same bottle of wine together or they open up a bottle of champagne together, but they're both drinking from the same bottle because he has one and he has sent her one. Uh I've had couples meet over the same meal. So they'll both order from DoorDash or Uber Eats and they'll get the same meal from the same restaurant and they'll share dinner together. I had a woman who lives in Sun Valley, Idaho, and it was snowing just a couple weeks ago. And her match that we matched her with here in California put on a ski parka and some goggles, and they had their virtual date together in the snow. (laughs) These people are interesting. You know, they're not going to just have some sort of bobblehead on a Zoom. They've got the lighting right. They know what's behind them in the background, and we're coaching people also. So what we did as a company is we rolled out a virtual dating platform we contact our client first, we set them up for success, we look to see what the lighting is like, where their head is and their body in in relation to the screen, what is behind them, we tell them how to turn off their notifications, we explain to them that this is the time, that it's only a half an hour meeting and that if they like the individual that they can then set up a second call because we don't want people just, you know, rambling on for hours and maybe the one person wants to get off but you can't really because you're on the screen. So we, we consider all of these things. And I have to tell you, Rebecca, I feel like we've been maybe doing this wrong all these years because this virtual matching has been so successful that every single person that's meeting is excited about their second and third and fourth match. And when they met in person, they weren't having that same excitement and reaction to see each other a second time. And so we as a company, you know, took this in, started asking questions. Why do we think this is happening? And the feedback has been that the noise of the traffic, the rushing to get to a dinner, Kids, you know, scheduling, hair, makeup, the noise of the restaurant, the waiter interruption, and all of that is a distraction with the individual that you're trying to meet for the first time in an authentic way. And virtual matching now, you can, just like you and I have our undivided attention, that's how these dates are happening. And so they're seeing the incredible match that is in front of them. And even though we always knew that was the case because we're the facilitator, they sometimes missed it. And now they're seeing it. So this is an exciting time for us as a company, and we will continue to keep this moving forward. But we've also redesigned many other things in our company, like I said. So it's an opportunity to start new and to change. So we're changing executives. We're changing our matchmaking. We're changing our training. We're changing our sales funnel. We're changing our advertising. Everything is being changed while the world is on pause. Yeah. Who knew? And I think there are a lot of companies, you know, I know I'm in the education space and we're finding that there were things we could do that we weren't doing yet that really were, like you're pointing out, that really were much better accomplished using some technology. So it's, I think it's really accelerated the use of some things. And it's interesting how you all found that same thing in your company. What do you expect for relationships going forward? Any quick words of wisdom on that? 
I need to change the way we are prepared because I believe that while we've had this wonderful niche and we've been an alternative or the next step for people that graduate from the Tinders and the Match.coms and actually want to meet somebody seriously, we've always been that go-to brand. I have a feeling now people, they can't meet in bars, they can't meet in movie theaters, they can't meet at concerts. And meeting strangers online right now is just really scary with this concern of diseases in the future, even when the virus opens up. Mm -hmm. So I have a feeling that our brand is going to be in such need because, see, we vet our clients Mm -hmm. and we know that not we used to vet them so that you don't end up with a married man or a serial killer. Right. People were like, yes, a beautiful woman. She goes on Tinder online and she's stalked by creeps. Sure. She comes sure. to a matchmaking service and we are her shield, which is why our KI logo is, is with the shield. Like we are going to protect our clients, right? So online, people don't have that. And now with the whole virus, it's like, ooh, do I want to kiss this guy? I don't even know who he is. And so there is really, I feel bad for the dating sites out there right now and for the restaurants and all the ways in which people used to organically meet. I'm a little, I'm excited about what that means for our industry, but I also am working very hard to make sure that we're prepared for it. I mean, we had the largest month in April that I've ever seen in our books. So Mm. I think we're just touching the iceberg of what's to come because wouldn't you want somebody to vet the person that you're going to be meeting? Sure. Even more so now. So that's my thought. I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't see it really being as easy to meet people Uh, dating sites and dating apps anymore. I think they're going to seem kind of careless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Amber, you've been very busy building this company with your mom, but you've also found a lot of time, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, you've also found a lot of time to be involved in a lot of philanthropic pursuits. I know you've hosted a charity event with Sir Richard Branson, big name we all know. And you've also been on the board, I think, of Virgin Unite and, and many, other, many other philanthropic causes. Tell us about some of the charity projects that you've worked on and why they mean so much to you and why you've gotten involved. Oh, wow. Thank you for asking this question. It's a wonderful to be able to talk about my passion within, within this business. I met Sir Richard Branson in 2012 through Common Friends. And, you know, he has this incredible foundation called Virgin Unite that is run by Gene Olwing and Richard himself. It was founded about 15 years ago. And it really has many ways in which it's helping the world, not only from the carbon footprint and the oceans, but also for endangered wildlife and for entrepreneurs to learn about business as a force for good with people and planet alongside profit. There's many, many amazing kind of divisions within Virgin Unite. So when I met Richard, I was flown to his island to meet with a group of business leaders to discuss how to improve on Unite. How do we bring more entrepreneurs and more change makers into Richard's world so that the world could change. The way he sees it, he wrote this wonderful book called Screw Business as Usual, which everybody should read. He's, he's written many books, but his vision is so powerful because he's used to knowing a lot of wealthy people. And when they give, when they exit their company for millions or billions of dollars, if they're lucky, and then they give back later, he thinks it's too late and it's too little. Why don't you take that business that was worth billions of dollars and add people and planet to that profit and make the business itself your legacy, make doing good and daily practice for thousands of employees. So take companies instead of a person and shift the company into doing good. And then the whole world changes. So when Richard met with me, he said, I want you, Amber, to choose the 25 people every year that can change the world and bring them to my island and let's co-host a think tank for leaders and inspire them with ways in which they can take the companies that they love and turn it into their legacy. So starting in 2012, I started bringing 25 people and I've been doing it now for seven years and we've changed over 70 companies. We've raised $6 million and we are changing the world in our own small but very unique way. And the ripple effects of these changes have gone into the billions. We have one example, a group of people that we brought is looking at nuclear fusion without radiation. It's a hundreds of billion dollar project. We had people connect 
through Kelleher that rented a boat with some celebrities, took it to the Galapagos Islands, raised $40 million and changed the way that they now fish so that the coral is not grabbed from the bottom of the ocean while they're grabbing the fish. Some of the most incredible changes through Sylvia Earle, who is like Jacques Cousteau of our time, some of these amazing changes to help the oceans and plastics and everything else have come from these meetings of Kelleher clients with Richard Branson on his island. So that was the epicenter of the passion of projects for me with philanthropy. But then each of these individuals, when we bring people, we bring speakers that own their own foundations and run their own foundations. And so it, it got much bigger than that in the fact that now we support probably 50 foundations and we've brought those leaders of those foundations to the island to speak in front of these leaders as inspiring examples of small. We brought Tim Tebow, for example. That's a big name. Mm -hmm. Tim Tebow is an amazing athlete. Well, Tim just came with us three weeks ago before or four weeks now before this pandemic, right at the middle of March. Tim Tebow spoke about the Tim Tebow Foundation. They work with children that have autism. They help kids rescue kids from sex trafficking. I mean, not only is Tim an amazing athlete, an incredible follower and devoted you know, Christian, but he is saving lives. And we brought Tim to the island, and now we are supporting the Tebow Foundation, as well as many others. So it, for me, this is the most incredible part about Kelleher, is this community of people that want to make a difference in the world, and they're meeting people on purpose, not just a romantic date. Wow. So that's you know, my dream job, right? That's where the dream comes in. Yeah, I was it's, just um, going to say, I was just going to say, I <laughs> totally get why this is a dream job for you. How exciting and how amazing to be around those kinds of deep thinking and generous giving people. That's exciting. And kudos to all of you for the difference that you're making. So, you know, you do have, I think, a dream job. And I am so impressed and excited to watch even more growth in your company. But I'm guessing that along the way, there have been some major challenges that you've also had to deal with. One of the things that we talk to students a lot about is that failure and, and major challenges are part of the pathway to success. Have you had any along the way that you'd be willing to talk about? And, and how have you used those and worked your way through those challenges? Well, there's so many lessons that you wish you you knew beforehand. So I think as a CEO, CEOs have, you know, responsibility to have a vision. And where the disconnect was for me for many years is that, so in other words, when you first start a company, it, it is your vision, right? It was my mother Jill's vision and mine. I created LA, went across the country, built all these offices. It was super simple. It's like, I wanted to do it. So I went and did it. My mom wanted to do it, so she went and did it. So you have this natural of business owners. They do everything. They wear all the hats. They create it, they go do it, and they do the billing, and they do everything. Well, as you grow, you have to hire people. Well, I need somebody to do the payroll. I need somebody to do the, the matchmaking. I need somebody to do the, you know, to be on the phone, you know, finding out who should come in. So memberships. Where I made a big mistake is that I hired an operator that didn't share my vision. And I didn't know that that was a problem. I didn't think that he needed to. I just assumed that that person would just do my vision. The problem that I have found, and looking back in retrospect, is that they didn't have the ability and the talent to execute. And so I would have these desires to move forward as a company, and we wouldn't go fast enough or in the direction that I wanted. I'll give you an example. He would hire matchmakers, but they weren't being trained under me. They were being trained under him, and he didn't know how to train matchmakers. So it became more of his internal company and my external company. I was out doing the press and the PR. I was out doing the philanthropy with Richard. I was out doing all of these things. And the company by itself, because of our community and because of the pieces to the puzzle with the matchmakers, it works. But it wasn't working at the level in which my mother or I would have taken it if we were the ones responsible for the day to day. Mm -hmm. So I would say as every business owner, when you need to take that amazing, incredible, successful leap of I need to now replace myself and make myself useful in what I'm best in and put all those other tasks in the hands of others, make sure that you hire somebody better than you 
in whatever role you're putting them in. So if you're putting them in payroll, they better know how to use QuickBooks mm-hmm. <laughs> if you don't. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to put them in operations, make sure they've done operations, not just your friend that's going to be like, oh, yeah, I got this. But like somebody that actually understands operations better than you, because if you're a business owner, you might not even really understand what operations is. Mm -hmm. And I probably didn't back then. So I hired a friend who did so-called operations, but he wasn't ever a COO. So I look back at that and I think, you know, we could have been even more global than we are. So I would say always hire somebody better and smarter than you in the roles that you don't need to be in and then take your key talents and use those so that that's what you focus on every day. And then as a team, your company should grow. That will save you years of agony and time. So that's my big lesson. Great lesson. There's a lot, but that's a good one for me too. Sometimes we have to live those things to really know them. So I totally get it. So Amber, you live with three children, two dogs, two horses, and your husband. So (laughs) you probably, in addition to all the you're running your business and the philanthropy and you've got a house full. Is there such a thing as balance? And do you have any tools or advice for those of us who are trying to balance a multitude of things, business, family, and other interests? Well, this was a question that was asked of Richard Branson when we were sitting together four weeks ago on his island before this whole world came to a halt. And somebody asked him the same question. They said, Richard, you own three quarters of the world. (laughs) And everybody (laughs) laughed. And they said, you know, you have children, you have grandchildren, you have a wife. How do you know what to focus on every day when you get up? Do you focus on your family? Do you focus on your business? And he had the same answer that I had, which is why I can bring him into this, because I think it's more interesting. How does Richard do it, right? He starts with himself every single morning. He wakes up. If he wants to go play tennis, he plays tennis. He has his cup of green tea. He reads the paper. You know, he has somebody checking all of his, all of his stuff. And around 11 or 12, he strolls into work and, you know, he has a team that gives him, he's much more fortunate than the rest of us, what his priorities are. But it it rang true to me. And I didn't learn this until a couple of years ago, because I did do too much and I burnt myself out and then I got kind of sick from it. So I had to take a step back and think to myself, I guess I can't be everywhere all the time. I can't be the mom at the PTA meetings and doing their homework and also doing their laundry and cooking for them and running a business and taking care of my clients and my staff and then doing philanthropy. And it was way too much. And I think I was able to maintain it because I'm an Aries and I naturally have a lot of energy, which I'm sure you can hear in my voice. And I loved it, but you still have to take downtime. So I'm similar to Richard in that I wake up in the morning, I make sure I get my eight hours of sleep. If I need more, I take more. I look at what time I go to bed at night and I know then what time I'm going to get up in the morning. And after that, I have my tea. I lay out in the sun for a few minutes because it's sunny in California. I get some little bit of, you know, that vitamin D in the morning, which is safe. And, you know, I read through some of my emails, might talk to my mom, see how she's doing. I stroll in for breakfast. I might go on a brisk walk. And around 11, my day begins. And, you know, I'm smarter now. I prioritize it. I have somebody in my email box. I have somebody doing operations. That's the best operator that anybody could ever ask for in the world. I went from maybe, quite frankly, just a friend that wasn't very good at it to literally the best operator on the planet. So, you know, I prioritize my time and I make sure that my evenings and my late afternoons are for my family. So I, you know, I check in with my kids. Everybody's homeschooled now. You know, maybe we'll go for a walk on the beach at sunset. We have dinner together and I'm with them through the evening. We might might watch a movie or I'm with my husband and then my day starts again. So in the past, I didn't take that time for myself and I'd lie in bed at night as a mom, which I'm sure, you know, anybody can relate to. That's a business woman Mm -hmm. and a mom. And you lie in bed and you go, well, I did 5,000 things today, but I didn't do anything for myself. Mm-hmm. But you think, well, I'm a mom. I'm not, I'm not really supposed to. It's about the kids. It's about my husband. It's about, you know, the animals. And it doesn't work that way. People get sick. And I did. And so now I start my morning with what do I need? And then the afternoon is what do I need to do for my company? And then the late afternoon and evening is all about family and connection. Great advice. Great advice. Well, 
I appreciate so much. I love this conversation. I've learned a lot and I'm so impressed with all that you've done. And I totally agree as someone who's been there, done that, and continues to sometimes overdo. It's really important to prioritize ourselves. So thank you for that. I have one last question I'd like to ask you before we leave. I'd like to ask everyone on the show this question. If there was one piece of advice, you've given us some great takeaways already, but if there was one piece of advice that you could share with our listeners, either that someone gave you or that you've learned along the way, what would it be? I would say that when you're coming out of school and you've been taught how to run a business, you know, you've, you've got your MBA or you understand now you're, you're ready to go in. There's a thing that people do naturally where they write down what they want and they have this whole idea, right? And they, they, they sketch it out. And that's great because there needs to be a plan. But my advice would be instead of separating yourself from that plan that sits on the table, Or that idea that sits on the table that's, you know, sometimes it's on a napkin at a restaurant. You got this idea, right? And that's how all businesses start. It's an idea. My one advice that is universal is once you know what that idea is, before it even starts, take a moment to close your eyes and imagine what it's like to be in that idea. Bring that idea into yourself and be and live in that idea for at least 30 seconds every single morning when you wake up because it is not removed from you if you're in it. And when you're in it and you feel, you literally feel what it's like to already be in your idea. It's a full-fledged business. It might be on a napkin from the ice cream parlor, but it is a full-fledged business in your mind. And you are not only in it, but you can feel what it's like to be in it. And if you can do that every single day, I guarantee that that idea on that napkin will become a reality and a lot faster than if you always put it on paper and have a barrier between who you are and what that is on that piece of paper. You have to bring them together. And that's my one advice because that will expedite the process and you will find yourself in that business sooner. Great advice. Thank you so much, Amber. Where can our listeners find out about Kelleher International and perhaps even connect with you? Well, Kelleher is three syllables. Sometimes people spell it wrong because it's a hard word, but it's it's Kelleher. And that's a little bit easier if you think about the spelling. So it's K-E-L-L-E-H-E-R. K-E-L-L-E-H-E-R. And it's Kelleher-International.com. That would be our website, the matchmaking website. If you want to follow me, I'm Amber underscore Kelleher on Instagram and on Twitter, Amber underscore Kelleher. But you can go to, if you want to contact me, just put Amber at Kelleher-International.com, just like our website. And, and that'll be an email that comes to me. And I won't get to it before 11 in the morning, but I'll see it <laughs> after I have my cup of tea and my walk. <laughs> And I'd love to hear from anyone and give them more advice. I mean, I think what you're doing on this podcast is fantastic and it's needed. And what a better way to learn from those that have already done it. I mean, you know, we think if we could go back and do it again, we would do it even bigger and better. But that's what your listeners, that's their job. Well, thank you so much, Amber, for giving back today and spending a little time sharing your experience. It's been a delight for me and really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Rebecca. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. 